Are you ready for this morning? We're talking about money again, all right? We're talking about the thing that you may feel in your life is not existent, all right? These things don't apply to me. It applies to people with money. But what we're going to do this morning is look at it from the perspective of being in charge of money, managing money like a boss. Because a lot of people don't feel like they're in control of their money. They think their finances are out of control. They've lost control. Now they're living and working for somebody else. The end of the month, you already know that all the money you worked hard for is not going to be your money. It's going to be somebody else's money. So how do we get that? What does the Bible have to say about that? So Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon once wrote, money is a great servant, but a bad master. Or you may have heard, money is a cruel master. So if you and I are in control of money, we it's a good thing to it's a good place to be but the moment we lose control we find that we get ourselves into all types of trouble our mind gets messed up we don't have freedom we don't enjoy life because we feel always burdened by finances so you and I need to remember money wants to be controlled with a firm hand if you and I don't control money properly money is going to be like a wild beast and it's going to take over our lives it's going to be like that cute puppy that we brought home remember your first paycheck it was that cute puppy that you brought home and then it got bigger and bigger nobody ever disciplined it now people are too scared to discipline it because the puppy ain't cute anymore the puppy's big and the puppy when you try you see that what happens with money so get it under control go to caesar what's that guy's name the dog whisperer sorry caesar milan. milan okay caesar milan and get him in to help you with your beast so i'll be your caesar today okay i'll be your like dog whisperer money whisperer today so money doesn't like being left without leadership you and i need to know that money doesn't like being left without leadership and when you and I are passive about it, we're basically leaving it leadership, uh, leaderless. So let's look at four things today, how to create wealth like a boss. Yeah, you want to be the boss? Four practices to manage wealth like a boss. And then we're the bosses, but why are the bosses facing challenges? And then giving like a boss. Number one is how to create wealth like a boss. So God meant for us to become creators of wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 says the lord your god gives you the ability to produce wealth you and i need to get that into our heads he gives us the ability to produce wealth every believer has the ability to produce wealth so why am i not producing wealth is god's covenant with me different no first thing to do is i believe I'm in a covenant, in the covenant, I have the ability to produce wealth, but wealth production doesn't happen in a vacuum. You and I need to go back to the Bible and see, well, how do I put this ability into practice? Two simple ways, wisdom and work. Proverbs 24 verse 3 says, by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures how do you get treasures you act wisely and you get knowledge what do you need to do to create wealth do you know what an investment is do you know where to invest now if you don't know that then you don't have knowledge and without that knowledge you cannot get treasure do you see so the bible is talking to us in simple ways so you always create more wealth with your brains than with your hands. Don't focus on working harder. Educate yourself. Read a book on finance every quarter. And you will find that there's always something that you'll change and it will move you forward. Right? The second thing is work. 
Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. I mean, Bible is literally saying, if you work hard, you get rich. Literally. Now, do a thing like this. How much downtime is in your life? How many days go by and there's nothing productive being done? When you count that, it will equal your salary at the end of the month. But the more you work and put in productive days, you will see the automatic effect, and that is you will move forward in terms of finance creation. All right? So George Clarson, he shares a timeless principle in a book written in 1926. He says, rule number one, start by first, thy purse to fattening. So what he says is, the first thing that you do when you earn money is invest money. The very first rule. Now, if at this point in our lives, most of our income is going towards debt, what we are doing is this. We are working and we're giving our money to somebody else and we're making them rich. When you get into debt and we buy things we don't need, we just made the person who produced the product or gave us the service, we just worked and we said, here's a couple of days of mine, I'm giving it to you in money terms. And when you do that, we start a slow descent into poverty. So in the first third of your life, in the first, this is for young people, in the first third of your life, do nothing else but save, invest, and create assets. Do nothing else. Don't spend your money. Don't buy a car. Don't buy clothes. Though you can afford it, do nothing. Invest money. That's for one third. In the second third, you'll start seeing all that money will start coming back to you. Now, those who are adults here and have not done this, you're saying to me, if I'd done this years ago, I would be chilling now. Because what most people do the moment they get money is spend it. The moment I know I've got a job, I can get credit. I'll go buy that jeans, that shoes, that TV, that car, that dress, that makeup. I go straight. And I worry about the consequences later. All right? Robert Kiyosaki says the poor and the middle class work for money, the rich have money, work for them. All right? Number two is four practices to manage wealth like a boss. Firstly, we say you can be a boss, ne? God said you can be a boss. Depends if you use wisdom and you're willing to work hard. The first trick over here, the practice, is live below our means. Live below your means. Now, that's the Joseph principle. You read about that in Genesis 41, where Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, seven years of massive wealth are coming our way. Don't eat it all. Save 20%. Put it away. But 20% of a lot is going to be a lot. Store that away. Because after that, there's a crisis coming. A famine. But you won't even worry. Because you'll have so much store. So, what is our budget? <clears throat> that means, whatever your income is, let's say your income is 10,000 Rand a month. You treat it like you're only getting 8,000 Rand in. And you say, Pastor, even that 10,000, I'm not getting by. You're not getting by because your standard of living is too high. When you got, when you had no money, 2,000 Rand would have been high. But you didn't get 2,000, you got 10,000. So instead of setting your cap at 10,000, you set it at 12,000 because the bank said you can get a credit card. The moment you spend money, tomorrow's money. You already know that you've gone ahead of yourself. Now here's the thing. You and I need to convince ourselves and believe this. No matter what your 80% looks like, and it means a massive reduction in your standard of living, or so you may think, they're ready, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of millions of people living at your 80%. They're ready living. <clears throat> If you and I don't reduce our, income, our, our standard of living to below our means, you'll never get wealthy. You will never. Because what do you do with the 20% that you're saving now? That is the portion that you can go and invest. And if you don't invest, well, one day you're going to retire. 
You may spend 20 years of your life in retirement. Do you know that? Anywhere from 15 to 25 years where you won't be having the salary. But if you didn't save the money now, where's 25 years of income going to come from? You see, we need to be ready. So what do we do with that money? We invest it for wealth creation, we preserve it for retirement, and then we prepare for um, emergencies. Now, you may think this is strange and it's impossible. If you are tithing 10% and you are saving 10 to 15% in your retirement, did you know that you're already living on 75% on your income? Because you're already putting that 25%. You're giving 10 and you're saving 15. So what I'm saying is, what seems to be so impossible? Just by saving for retirement, most people are doing that. And tithing, most people are doing that. People are already living at 75. If you could manage 75, you can manage 70. So push your, lower, push your standard down in order to become a wealth creator. Dave Ramsey said, if you will live like no one else now, then you will live like no one else later. Right? Then, number two is maintain a budget. The Bible says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower, what's the first thing? Sit down and figure out how much it costs and if you can afford it. So suppose one of you wants a car. Hmm, we could put car in there. What's the first thing that you do? You first sit down, you figure out what the repayments are, and then you ask yourself if you can afford it. If the answer is, I can't afford that car, then you afford this car, right? But what we want is we want all the bells and whistles right off the bat. And guess what? The dealer says, you're our best customer because it's people like you that make us rich. Because you go and work for a couple of days and then you give us your money. And at the end of the month, you're paying debt, but there's nothing, no wealth that is being created. Right, so a budget will speak to you. Now sometimes it'll shout, right? But you and I have to see what is happening with our money. And that's the first place that we can control things, where we can cut back and what we can do with the money saved. Number three is save to pay cash for a purchase that you will buy in the future the things that foolish people are buying now and are willing to go into debt for so what we're we saying now the third way to manage money properly is whatever you want and if you see you cannot afford it you don't touch your credit card you say, I'm going to have it, but I'm first going to save. I'm going to buy it cash. Now, other people are going to go straight, and the credit card says you can easily manage the payment of 750 a month, so you can buy that item worth 5,000 Rand. But then the minimum interest you're going to be paying is 18. As much as 40 if you go to a loan shark. The most you're going to get from a bank is 3 to 4 to 7%, maybe 12% if you're fixed. So the bank is happy to, happy to lend us money because of the big returns. So if you can't afford it, you and I are going to have to get used to saying, I cannot afford it. But it doesn't mean never, it just means later. And that's what people don't understand. You don't have to deny yourself. I like this quote, buy what you can afford, not what you can borrow. Buy what you can afford, not what you can borrow. I like what W. Clement says, if you cannot save money, the seeds of greatness are not in you. Number four, get out of debt. Avoid debt, stay out of debt. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. That's what it's gonna feel like once you go into debt. You're gonna dread the phone call, you're gonna come up with excuses, I'm on maternity leave. Man, you're 60 years old, you're way past, you past menopause, now I'm on maternity leave. All right, I'm in hospital. And you're gonna to have to come up with all creative excuses and people are gonna say, listen, do you have a life insurance policy? Because every time we phone you for our money, you're always sick, in a hospital, pregnant. You're going to feel discouraged because you know you're working hard, but at the end of the day, you're giving money away. And the only way you can have a family birthday, a nice Christmas, all it is to go into more debt. And you're like, what am I doing with all my money? Number three, why the bosses are facing financial challenges. So even if you are a boss, why is it that we are facing financial challenges? 
Well, there's four reasons we touched on some already. We're being socially engineered to be consumers, not wealth creators. Do you know that you are being engineered to spend money? That you're being engineered to make somebody else rich? Do you know even when you go into your supermarket, that that supermarket is engineered to make you spend money? I thought it was interesting. When you get into the supermarket, the trolley's up front. The baskets are over there. You can get a trolley because you can fill it. But the basket you've got to go and look for. Then you've got to go through that Isle of Doom. Okay? You've got to like... Because that chocolate, that magazine, the bolton, the nuts. I mean, it's just 10 rand, it's just 15 rand. And it goes slow, hey? And the reason is, they know how to get money out of us. Another thing that is happening is something called planned obsolescence planned obsolescence so that means is every three years every year every two years there's a new phone with new features if you and i are not careful every two three years we we upgrade boom well we think we upgrade if you and i do that we will never be out of a cell phone contract our whole lives do you see how we've been programmed to part with our money it's pretty amazing how in 1512 that some countries had what they called um, consumption laws or sumptuary laws there were literally laws in society where they said you may not have too much of this or this and this because they realized that people could get greedy listen to this in Venice in 1512 as a wedding gift you were not allowed to receive more than six forks and six spoons as a wedding gift all right you were not allowed to get a gilded chest in other words like a container but made all fancy and mirrors were completely forbidden as gifts so the government even said listen we're capping this you guys are out of control but today we've gone the very opposite and we say there's no control i don't know there are two places that if i go with marissa I say, Marissa, hold my hand. <laughs> and hold my wallet. The one is a bookshop. She must just hold me. Because if there's a book, I will find a way to afford that book. And I will need the book. I will see the quality of life. It's an education. The other place is Leroy Merlin. <laughs> Marissa, hold both hands. Because I'll just see the screw that I'll need, or the wood glue, or the power tool on special, or the wood. Basically, every aisle has got me. You know, like that sweet aisle at the end of a shop? That's every aisle for me in Leroy Merlin. So I just know going there <laughs> with a plan. And there's so many nice things on offer. If you and I are not in control, then we slowly but surely going to make other people happy and rich. Number two, why the bosses are being challenged is consumer debt and open circle living. In other words, open circle living is when we don't put a cap on our lifestyle. We just say we're going to spend what we can. And normally it's going to be on credit. So if our budget is here, the credit card allows our budget to be there. And that extra portion we will buy on credit. Now, there was a time in South Africa, you may not know it, you could not get unsecured credit. I was working, I was earning a long time ago, two and a half thousand, right? I was a single man, two and a half thousand. I wanted to buy a car, the bank would not give me the loan. The car was 20,000, they said you don't have enough security, you only have a salary. They denied me. So I had to wait for one and a half years to buy the car. Do you know that when you're young, eh? and you're earning a salary and you want those wheels, one and a half years may as well be 30 years. But they denied me. But the good thing was, after that I bought the car cash. Didn't owe a cent. From about 2004, 2005, all of that changed. So that people can get credit now even without proving that you can repay it. 
Just as long as you've got an ID, a little bit of a bank statement showing you've got a bit of an income, you can get it. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not ready for that amount of freedom. I like what Eric War says. He says, becoming rich is hard. Staying broke is hard. You gotta choose what type of hard you want in your life. Then the third thing affecting all of us is country maladministration. Here is something Ecclesiastes 10 says, I've seen in this life that isn't fair. It's the kind of mistakes that rulers make. Fools are given important position. So in our country, we have a lot of fools. I'm sorry to say, it's not a political speech. I'm just telling you what's already happening. You already know it. Do you know that in our country, maladministration is wasting more, listen to this, more than a billion rand a day. Now you're not going to believe the next figure, but let me share it with you. If we took the money that is being wasted <clears throat> and we gave two and a half thousand rand to the citizens of the country, just out of the money that's been wasted in mon one month, guess how many citizens we could give two and a half thousand rand to? Just guess. Twelve and a half million. 12 and a half million people in South Africa could get two and a half thousand rand for free if the government stopped wasting money. That's literally how much is going. Now you and I are suffering under maladministration. I like what is happening in Singapore. Singapore is a country like ours, dirt poor, didn't have much going on. They're an island, a lot of swamps. They turned their country around. Three things that they did to turn their country around. The first one is meritocracy. Meritro meritocracy. You only are in a position if you can do the job. It doesn't matter your race, the political card you carry. If you cannot do the job, you don't get the job. Number two, pragmatism. Right? If it works, do it. Number three, honesty. Now this is interesting. They started to identify when the new president came in, the prime minister. He started to identify all the corrupt officials. This is what he did. He left everybody at the bottom alone. He left the middle ranks of the uh, leadership alone. He went after the people in the top positions. He took everyone in the top positions out. And then everything else corrected itself. Let me ask you, when last did you hear of somebody that's corrupt? that has been actually tried and put in jail. Now this has been going on for 30 years. When last did you hear that? You see? Now like what they said. They said, it doesn't matter if the cat is black. It doesn't matter if the cat is white. If the cat catches the mouse, it's a good cat. Number four is crisis. No one could predict or event, prevent COVID, the war between Russia and the Ukraine, time and unpredictable events overtake all people. There's some things that no matter how you and I manage our wealth, there's just some going to be things that happen. Does that mean that your joy needs to go with that? No. Does that mean you and I need to freak out and stress? No. Because there's more to life that makes us happy and brings us enjoyment than what's in our bank account. If you and I cannot be happy before we get wealthy, then you and I won't be happy when we get wealthy. Go and take a walk outside, enjoy fresh air. Invite people for a cup of tea, it doesn't have to be a bribe. All right, you can watch something on TV, you don't have to go to the movies. You can make a nice meal at home, you don't have to go to the restaurant. There's so many ways that we can be happy because happiness and joy is an internal, depends on the internal, the condition of our internal environment, not what is happening on the outside. Then lastly, giving. You know, God meant for us to become a community of carers, and that is almsgiving. Ephesians 4, 28 says, He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands. That's almsgiving. So a portion of our income must go to help others. You see, when you're a boss, it means you're in control of your stuff, and you can use your money to make a difference. But when you and I on not managing money properly. We feel we are the people that always need to be taking the handouts. And God says, you're not being the boss, you're being a slave. 
All right? So we have, a mission, we have an account, a benevolent account, and if you want to put money into that, we make sure it gets to the people in the church who need it. Then lastly, God meant for us to be contributors to God's kingdom. Right? So God gives us a measure of wealth, and he says, act like a boss. Act like a boss. A boss at a company knows what bills need to be paid. So you and I as Christians should be bosses, managers of God's kingdom. Do we not know what bills need to be paid in God's kingdom? Well, then if we're a good manager, pay those bills. The first one is the regular expenses. That's running the church, all the salaries, the normal wear and tear, the electricity bills. That is tithing every month. So we pay expenses. The second thing is expansion, furthering the spread of the gospel. So we also have missions in the church. If you want to take a portion of your money, like a boss, and give it to missions, you're expanding the kingdom of God. The third one is an excellent home, keeping our home in a good condition. We do that through free will offerings, and we do that through pledges. So this month, before the month is out, we want to focus on how is it that we, as partners in this church, are going to be managing wealth for those three areas. The, genu the rem um, general expenses of the church, the expansion of the kingdom, and then living in a nice home. So I want to encourage you, go home, look at your budget. Decide what you're going to give. Because we're going to hand forms out and then people can make a commitment. But folks, listen to me, please. If you cannot even tithe, if you're always in debt, then you're a slave. And God says, I don't want you to be a slave. I want you to be a boss. I want you to be in control of money. All right? It is possible. You know, there was a time that Marissa and I, <coughs> Marissa and I, were earning a small salary. We, we never, ever stopped tithing. That was never a problem for us. But I couldn't at that point even afford, well, I thought in the back of my mind, to pay if I was getting two and a half thousand. I couldn't even take... 250 rand towards a retirement annuity. When I sat down with a financial advisor one day, he said 250. I said, are you crazy? Where am I going to get the money? He said, I don't know. I'm just here to give you the advice. Anyway, I bit the bullet and went ahead and just kept on doing that. And then the things we've spoken about just kept on doing that. Marissa and I only live on 52% of our gross income. You know that? Only 52%. It goes up sometimes, maybe it can go to 60. But between 40 and 45% of our income is given or saved. That's a big amount. But I'm telling you, there was a point at which I felt we couldn't even get past the tithe. Now, young folks, middle class, middle age folks, you think your parents are wealthy, right? Isn't that true? Your parents are the ones with the money. Here's the reason. Your parents weren't always that way. But they practiced sound financial principles. They just did it year in, year out. When it felt easy, when it felt difficult. And then the word of God that says, he who gathers money little by little becomes wealthy. And I'm saying to you that your parents are not geniuses. They weren't born with spoons in their mouths. How they became wealthy is just practicing simple habits year in and year out. If you're in debt, that's how you'll get out of debt. When you get to a neutral debt position, when you don't owe money, and you keep on doing that, you become wealthy. But I want to say it's within reach of every single one of us. If you need a little bit of advice, pick up a book. You're welcome to speak to me. There are many people in the church who manage their finances as well. We can put you in touch with them. But let's everybody get out of debt. Let's everybody get wealthy. Let's everybody be managers of the kingdom of God this year. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's pray if you feel that you're struggling with debt. Let's just say, God... This is the year I get out of debt. Maybe if you've been living in a neutral position, you're not losing money, but you don't feel you'll be able to save, say, God, this is the year I want to start creating wealth. Maybe if you've been gathering wealth and you want to make a difference with your wealth, say, this year, Lord, I want to make that difference. Can we pray? Let's raise our hands.
So Father, we come before you as a church. We want to pray, get us out of debt. Get us out of debt, Lord. It, it's very discouraging to know that we're working so hard and seem to be getting nowhere. So I pray, Father, that this be a year of debt cancellation in the name of Jesus. Every thief, every robber, every plague, every disease come against us and the enemy too. Father, we pray, stop that in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for those who are living, just meeting needs. I want to pray that you'll take every single person into a position of wealth in Jesus' name. And then I want to pray, Father, for those who have got something to spare. Let us, Father, as far as possible, maximize the investment in your kingdom for eternal purposes. We believe that this year will change because you are going to be our partner in finances. In Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.